All right, what I want to do um, for just a few minutes, i try to take a half an hour here and um, share, some <laughs> share something that um, the Lord is, it's not something, it's something we've been talking about. I'm not the type to every time we get together, I got something new. Because if you do that, 52, 52 weeks out of the year, two times a year, you got 104 sermons, are you going to remember those? Absolutely. It's just going to be. So what I try to do is, is hear what God is saying and then mine out all the riches of that word. And that's why we do a lot of series. And that way, maybe in one year we spoke 12 things and they, and they, they were part of each other. They piggybacked on each other. And then you know, like a smorgasbord, they just throw things at you. But what I try to do is zero in on specific things so as the year goes by, we can see what God is saying and where He's leading us. And I'd rather you know that than forget 104 messages. I, don't, I wouldn't even remember them. How, how are you going to remember them? So what I want to share, and again, it's, it's a lot of things we've been developing, and we'll just keep doing that. And um, one of the things that I, we've always talked about is what Jesus told His disciples. I mean, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh. He's with them. I don't know how they really understood that, that the incarnation of God, Jesus in human flesh. But he was there, God in their midst. And um, they, had him, they had an audience with him for three and a half years. But he, toward the end, he says, John 14, 15, 16, he says, it's expedient for me that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the comforter won't come. Now he's saying it's to your advantage, expedient, it's to your advantage that I go away. That would be hard. That would be like saying it is to your guys advantage that I leave and then some invisible thing's going to come and you're going to have to figure out who he is, have a relationship with him because he's not going to be flesh and blood, it's going to be a spirit. How is that better? Isn't it easier to relate to flesh and blood than some invisible spirit that you can't see, can't touch, can't hear, can't... So, but it is. Or He wouldn't have done it. So you have to understand this, that Jesus said, and I don't think the church understands this, but Jesus said, it is so much better, so much glorious, it, it, that you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit than you do with me in the flesh. And again, how, how's, how's that work out? Well, you, you develop that. But we see that the Spirit was given to Jesus. Holy Spirit came on Him, and the first thing the Spirit did after His baptism was the Spirit led Him where? Into the wilderness. So He didn't go there on His own. The Holy Spirit came on, and the Holy Spirit led Him. Meaning, and we know what you have to understand is the Trinitarian faith. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one. So, God is Father, Jesus is God the Son, and the Spirit is God the Spirit. So it's the three in one. So, Jesus had the Holy Spirit unveil what the Father was doing. So the Holy Spirit became Lord to Jesus. Because Jesus will go on to say, I do nothing unless the Father tells me to do it. And I don't say anything unless I hear the Father. He says, my doctrine is not mine. It's the Father's. How he, ha how he related to the Father was through the Holy Spirit. That's why the Spirit was given. So you have the Trinity working. God the Father speaking to the Son by way of the Spirit. Jesus moving by way of the Spirit, doing miracles by way of the Spirit. It was the Father's will on the Spirit being unveiled to Jesus. And they were all in a relationship together. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But Jesus did not come down here. And he even said in the garden, Lord, not my will, but what is the Spirit saying? What is the Spirit doing? And that's what he was tuned into. He took all his cues from the Holy Spirit. So he had a relationship with the Spirit. He knew that without the Holy Spirit, he couldn't be able to do what he did. So that's why he says, when I go, you need the Spirit that I had. Does that make sense? Flesh and blood, Jesus, had a spirit, and that made him successful for three and a half years. He's gone. We're flesh and blood. He gives us the same spirit, the same, the same am amount, same manner, same, not anything less, just the same exact spirit, quickening our mortal bodies. 
and that we have the same ministry, same ministry of the Father by way of the Spirit on us. So we have to learn how to relate to the Spirit the way Jesus did. Hear Him, move within Him. In Him we live and move and have our being. So, um, so as Jesus was led by the Spirit in the New Testament, we see that God was leading Israel by pictures and types and shadows. For instance, in the Old Testament, they were led by a cloud at daytime and a pillar of fire by night to get from Egypt to the, to the Promised Land. They couldn't get there on their own, so they had a cloud and a, and a pillar of fire. That's a type of the Holy Spirit. Then it says He led them to the waters of Mirabah. So God is leading them because they can't get there on their own and we can't get where we're supposed to be on our own without the Holy Spirit getting us there, leading and guiding us there. So we really have to understand the importance of the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I'm going to show you this scripture. Um, the fir I, I, it's not the first one. We're going to go back to these two slides, but go to the third one. It, will, it won't have a scripture reference because it filled up the whole screen. So go back. No, you're way too far. He's got three slides to work with tonight. <laughs> right there. There we go. Now listen to this. This is 2 Corinthians 3.18. We can all draw close to Him with the veil removed from our faces. And with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord, the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into His very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another, and this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord. Now watch this. This glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord. Who's the Lord? Jesus. Okay? But this glorious transformation comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now you can take this and translate it in the Greek. And it will say the Spirit is Lord. The Lord gave, gave us this revelation clear back in the 90's. The Lord is the Spirit. Therefore, the Spirit is Lord. We had John Sheesby in 1993-94 and he shared that out of 2 Corinthians 3.18. That something within me, this is like 1994, went off and if you go to our church today, our sign says, and we put this sign up, God, and it's an old sign. It really needs to be redone. But it's old. But we put that up 30, 20 plus years ago, Restoration Church, where the Spirit is Lord. And that comes from this verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So what you need to understand is the Holy Spirit is who's on earth that was given to us. He's the Lord. And we know that He's Jesus, and we know that He's God because of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So when we understand that the Spirit is Lord, that means we have to have the exact same relationship Jesus had with, with the Holy Spirit. Jesus would do nothing apart from what the Spirit was unveiling to Him. Does that make sense? So... It's, you know, Bree was talking about religion. Religion doesn't need the Holy Spirit. It has rules. It has regulations. It has methods, steps, secrets, keys. All this stuff you can do apart from the Holy... We know how to have church without the Holy Spirit. Big screens, smoke machines, and skinny jeans. You got that and a bunch of people and you got a good charismatic personality, you can have church anywhere, anytime, and do whatever you want. Money... People, you don't need the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the difference is, and we're going to show you when we get, well, let's just go there. We're not going to look at scriptures. You know these scriptures because they're very common. He goes to the church at Ephesus and he says, I know your works. And he lays them out what they're doing. And if you, if you stop before he gets to nevertheless, that's that but. Somebody, if somebody starts building you up and they put a but, uh, here, here comes, here comes the bomb. But if you stop it, nevertheless, you got to give that church an A plus. They're doing the works. But he says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You left your first love. So here's this church doing all the works, talking about Jesus, worship, 
big worship team, everything, and they're doing it on their own, apart from Him. Then he goes to another church in, 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 in the seven churches of Revelation, says, the Laodicean church, he says, I'm not even in the church. He says, I stand at the door and knock. You guys are in there having church and the Holy Spirit's not Lord. He's not in there. So, and, he, and, and what he said to the church at Ephesus, if you don't get this fixed, I'm removing your lampstand. That doesn't mean he's sending the people to hell. He says, you will not represent me as light as a church. I'm going to take the church out. And then you'll all be scattered and you'll go to other churches. But this church will no longer represent me because you've left your first love. Then at the Laodicean church, he's, he's on the outside trying to get in. He says, yeah, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. Again, not individuals but who we became as a corporate church in the community, in the area, in the region. Are we light or have we snuffed that out and became very religious and all we're doing is dead works? So this is him talking to churches, not individual people. However, individual people, we want to pay attention to that because how did we don't want to lose our first love. And let me tell you what first love is. I was raised in church thinking first love was I need to go back to when I first got saved and... I didn't love G. I got saved at 15, a sophomore in high school. I did not even, I didn't love him. He, he took that, he met me where I was, but I can't tell you that I loved him in a year, two years, three years. And when Jesus tells me that I'm supposed to love God with all my heart, body, soul, and strength, I ain't doing that to this day. Being honest, and I don't know if we all, anybody is. He says to Peter, do you love me, agape? He says, Lord, I don't know. He says, do you agape me, Lord? I don't. He, then he brought it down to Philio. Do you, do you, are you friendly love with me? He's meeting him to where he's at. Peter couldn't love him with agape love. We can't, we can't agape love unless the Holy Spirit's doing that agape love through us. But the first love is to, that the Ephesus is supposed to return to. And, it's, and the Bible tells us what the first love is. Did you first love him? He first loved you. You return to the first love, not your father's love, not your mom's love, not your parents, you know, your, your, your friends or who. First love. Who really loves you? He first loved us. Return to his love. Don't, don't point to your love. It's not capable. You can only love as he loves through you. But again, that's, that's what the, and Ephesus didn't do that. Historically, if you go look at it, that church did not do that. They got, they got taken out, and, and for years, and, and, and if I remember right, there's not even in anything in that area. It's a, it's, a, it's a wilderness. Nothing's been even rebuilt there. Um, so, and then the church of Laodicea, he's about to vomit them out of their, out, out of their mouths. All I'm saying is, this, these are churches that was having church without the Holy Spirit. Okay? And we, if, if we can be religious without the Holy Spirit. Just do, do this, don't do that, show up, do the works. Now, Moses goes up on the mountain. And he's going up there to get the Ten Commandments. I don't know if he really knows he's getting those Ten Commandments. But he's, get, he's going to get the Ten Commandments. But while he's up there, he says, Lord, I want to see your face. And he says, no one has seen my face and you know, can, can live, but I'll tell you what, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll let you see my backside, and it says his glory passed before him, which is his goodness. That affected Moses so much, he had a one-on-one -on -one encounter, that when he came off of the mountain, and this is what this chapter is about, if you read this chapter, um, 2 Corinthians 3, you'll read um, like ver verses 10 on or something like that, it's all about Moses and the veils and glory. He says, so Moses comes off, and his face is shining to where Israel just can't, can't look at it. And it's whatever, depending upon whatever translation you're reading, you can make that translation say that Moses put the veil over his face so Israel couldn't see it. But if you read it in other translations, and I think this is the way it needs to be interpreted, is that he put, the, put something, a veil, over his head so they wouldn't see that it was fading. Because as soon as he came off that mountain, it was fading. Meaning that if he wants to keep the glory on him, he needs to go back into the glory and come out. Starts to fade. Go back into the glory. 
come out, do your thing, but when it starts to fade. And he didn't want them to see the glory was fading off of him. Well, see, what is the veil today? You can't, you, you, you would never know if I'm in the presence of the Lord daily, weekly, because I could hide behind works. So you, pastors today can say, we've got, we, we got 100 saved, we got 50 baptized, and we're doing this and we're doing that, and you don't even know how much time he's spending in the presence of God, or if he's even getting direction from the Lord. He may be getting it from a church growth manual. He may be just doing it because it's the thing to do. But you'll never know the, the glories off of him because his veil is all the works that he's doing. And you can't say anything because, hey, the church is doing... But the church at Ephesus was doing the... We got 100 saved. We got 50 baptized. And Jesus says, I will forego all of that because your lips are near and your heart is far away. I don't want those works. They're not from me. It's what you're doing it's your religious works doing that. I'll honor it, but I'm not in it. People are getting saved. People are getting baptized. But he'll forego that for the heart. That's what you get out of the, out of this, out of the Scriptures in Ephesus. He's like, I see your works, but I will forego those works to get, back, you, to get you back to my heart. And so in the Scriptures, their lips are near, but their hearts are far away. He doesn't care. So when you get the you get the um, Matthew chapter seven, and it says, "Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Lord, did we not heal the sick in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name?" He said, "I never knew you." That word "know" is the same word Adam knew his wife Eve, and they had a son. It's an intimacy. It's a heart relationship. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. Moses, and, and so in, I think it's Psalms 107, it says Moses um, knew God's ways. But the children of Israel only knew His acts. Now that's a scripture we, we, we gloss over, but you, this, is, this is profound. Moses knew His ways. How? He was intimate. He was up in that mountain. He was seeing the glory of God. It was on him. He had a one-on-one -on -one with God. And he came down off of the mountain. And Israel would never go to that mountain. Remember, they said to Moses, you just you go up. And whatever God tells you, we'll do. That's when religion started. We'll do what you tell us. They don't want to hear it for themselves. They don't want an encounter. They don't want a one-on-one. -on -one. They want a religion. Just tell me what to do. And I'll go do it. And then I don't have to have a relationship. I don't have to spend time with him. I'll, I can do it and go do my own thing. So Moses knew his ways, but Israel only knew his acts. Religion only knows the acts of God, and therefore they do them. But to know the ways of God, you've got to wait on him, hear him, and don't move until you hear and see. And that's a huge difference between the two. So Moses is up there, get ready for this, Moses is up there having an encounter, a one-on-one, -on -one, and what's happening on the, in, on, in the valley? At the bottom of the mountain? They're building a golden calf, an idol. If you're not up on that mountain, knowing God's ways, and having that one-on-one -on -one encounter, you will have idols. Yeah, but I'm saved. Yeah, but I go to... All that's idols. What do you think... The, the church at Ephesus had it in the church and the church of Laodicea that was all idol stuff idols religious idols and God says I'm not in it and I'm not on it I mean think about it if you're not having encounters with God you're going to be having you're going to be building idols in your life because the only way to get rid of idols is to stay in the presence of God now here's why I want to close with this because this is huge so Israel lost the ark. Inside the ark was those ten commandments. The pot of manna, and then the, um, the rod that budded, Aaron's rod. And that was the glory of God. That ark represents the presence of God, the glory of God. So when they would go into battle, they'd take that ark and win every time. That ark was in the Holy of Holies in the temple. Remember the people that tried to open the ark and look into it? They literally got wiped out. 
And so it's a holy thing. It's, it's where the presence of God was. And the only people that could go in there was the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. So this is serious business. But they lost the ark under King Saul. He never wanted it back. He let the Philistines have it. And he went on. Well, David becomes king. And he wants the ark back in Jerusalem. So he says, go get the ark. Well, as that was happening... Philistines were having a hard time with that ark. Tumors were breaking out on people, sicknesses, disease, all that. And, and so they're like, is this ark causing? This, this ark of Israel, is it causing all this damage? And so they put that ark on a cart. And they put cows on it. And these cows had calves. What's the natural tendency of a calf? To go straight or to go to where the calves are? They're, they're going to go where the calves are so they can, they can, they're milk cows, so that they can feed the calves. So they said, we'll put this ark, this, the ark on this cart, and if this is God, they won't, natural instinct, they won't go to their babies, their calves. They'll go straight into Beth Shemesh, which is on the way into Jerusalem. It, it'll go right back to Israel where it then needs to belong, because we can't handle this disease. It's like the, death, it's like the black plague, getting wiped out. So, of course, the presence of God is on those wild animals, and they don't go to the, to the calves. It says, they, loathing as they went. Their nature wanted to go, but the presence of God on them made them go straight into Beth Shemesh. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, here it is. They're coming into Beth Shemesh, and here's Israel like, hey, the, it's, it's returned. David's happy. Let's bring it back into Jerusalem. And so they, put, they build a new ark. Or a, new, a cart, a new cart for the ark. And they stick it on that cart. And David's dancing, it's a parade, it's, they're having a good time. And all of a sudden the ark starts moving, right? From potholes, whatever. Terrain. And Uzzah, guy, one, one of the guys, wants to just steady the ark so it doesn't fall off. That's all he wants to do. He, so it's going like this, ready to fall off. He steadies it and he gets strike dead. And David's like, he just rained on my parade. David's mad. I don't want the ark. And he, he goes to his back home and he's like, mad? So they gave the ark to this Gentile. Uh, this Gentile. I can't think of his name now. Um, but anyway, but when the ark gets to this guy's house, he starts getting blessed. The pre Remember, the ark represents the presence of God. The glory of God. On a Gentile who's not doing the Ten Commandments, who, who doesn't understand the, the Jewish religion. That ark is in this guy's house, and he's getting blessed, his family's getting blessed, his kids are getting blessed. It gets back to David, and David goes, I want that blessing. So he says, bring the ark back. Now, and I'm not going to go with the rest of the story, and he does, he brings the ark back. But why did, why did Uzzah get wiped out? And we had stories, and they're, and they're good, you know, the move of God, man can't touch the move of God. Man should not, God's not going to share his glory with another. Here are all kinds of things. And Saul could be fine. But here's the kicker. That ark, if you go back to Leviticus, was never supposed to be put on a cart. A wooden cart. That's, that is a no-no. Well, how do you get the cart into Jerusalem? How did they get the cart around before that time? Before the Phil it was the Philistines who came up with the idea to put the cart, the ark, on a cart. Prior to that, men carried it on their shoulders. Two poles, four guys. It was never put on a cart, it was to be shouldered. Meaning, God never wanted the presence to be apart from you experiencing it, encountering it, and carrying it, your personal self. And what has the church done? We keep, we keep building arcs. We met, we're building um, carts. An eight-foot cart. A four-foot a four cart. A cart with eight wheels. A cart with six, a 16-wheeler. I mean, we, we, we paint it red. We paint it green. We have done everything God under the sun took carts to put the ark on to bypass the fact I got to carry it. I got to ascend the mountain. I have to have a personal will. I have to hear. And if I don't hear, I don't move. 
How many pastors have the gall, the, the, you know what, the gonads to do that? Church expects pastors to do this, pastors to do that. If he ain't hearing it, he ain't supposed to do it. And if he does it, he'll need a cart to do it because the Holy Spirit's not on it. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. That's why the Spirit is Lord. That's church. In our own lives. The Spirit leads me to do this. The Spirit leads you to do that. And if the Spirit's not, and if you're not shouldering that, then you're not hearing Him. You're not seeing Him. And you're definitely not encountering Him. What you'll do is you'll take God and put Him on some cart called ambition, a dream that you have, or something you want, and you'll try to, get, try to make it happen, and it's not what God is saying and doing. God will never, ever use Madison Avenue techniques, worldly ways and means. It is the old-fashioned, get your butt up on that mountain, and you don't come off of it until you get a word, until you see Him, hear Him, encounter Him. And then when you come off, the glory of God will be all over you. Signs and wonders will what? Follow those. Greater works in these shall you do. Same thing. Jesus could only do that because He'd get away. Listen to this. Do you realize that there would be like thousands of people in the next 10 minutes, I'll be able to heal Jesus, not me, Jesus. Okay, He's about ready to heal 10,000 people. All He's got to do is stay there 10 more minutes. But the Spirit says, it's time to go up to the mountain and be with the Father. i got all this ministry to do. And Jesus would say, that means nothing if you're going to forfeit that up on the hill with the Father. And He said, got to go. But Jesus, look at all... Nah, got to go. Because if this isn't priority, God won't care about any of that. Just like the church at Ephesus, I know your works. Like the people He said, I know you prophesy my name. You cast out demons on my name. You heal the sick in my name. I don't know you. You have a religion. You don't have me. And so, Jesus would forego all that ministry. And man, He had had fame... The more people he healed, the more fame he would have. He'd have more money, more fame, more. And he says, I don't want, it, that's not, it's about getting up on that mountain. It's about getting up early in the morning before anybody else starts pulling on me to get in that presence and hear him. Here's where I'm at. You do this with what you want, but here's where I'm at. I no longer read the Bible for the sake of reading the Bible because the Holy Spirit was given to me for what? To lead and guide me where? into all truth. So if I just read this Bible with my intellect, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a clue what it's saying. Or it could mean this, could mean that, could mean this, could mean that. And it's frustrating. But if I go to the Spirit and I hear Him and He says, turn to this Scripture or just start reading. Now I've got Him on me as I'm reading and then He'll have me stop and when I see it, it's His job to unveil it. But if I'm reading it without Him, good luck with that. That's religion. And then you only know that Bible according to your IQ and intellect. And it won't work. That's why we... Do you, do you guys do, realize we've got 40,000 different denominations? Do you also realize that there was only one church at one time? It was the Orthodox Church or Catholic Church. Catholic meaning not Catholic denomination wise, but Catholic meaning universal. Then they split in 1200 and then you had the Orthodox Eastern Church and you had the Catholic Church, the Western Church. That was it. Two churches. Until Martin Luther came in the 1500s. So up to the 1500s, there's either an Orthodox Church or a Catholic Church. That's it. Then Protestants came out of Luther. The, the Reformation. And from that point on, we have split 40,000 times. Ain't working. It's not working. Everybody's got their own interpretation. And I'm at the point like, well, I could tell you what I think it means, but there's five people out there will say, no, it means this. Sixteen other did. And it's very frustrating. So you wanted to say, Lord, Holy Spirit, you're my teacher. That's what he's called the teacher. And, and you're going to have to unveil this word to me. And, and, and when you get to... Now, go, now that takes me to this. I'm going to hurry up here. Go to the other one. But the moment one turns to who? The Lord. With an open heart. 
because it's the mind, it's the heart, not the mind. The veil, the veil is lifted, and they see. Now the Lord I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit, and where He is Lord, there is freedom. So the Spirit has to be Lord, and He's the one Lord when you're reading it. So here's where I said what season I'm in. I don't, I don't, I pray when the Spirit leads me to pray. Otherwise, I'm going to go there because I've done this a zillion times and it's about time I learned something here. But I've gone to pray to pray just for the sake of praying. I'm supposed to pray. It's a religious thing. It makes me feel good. I'm, nothing happens. It's just you, you sit there for an hour. You read. Okay, I did, I did my duty. And you come out. You did that apart from the Holy Spirit. You went up to the mountain without the Holy Spirit. So... What you do is you, the Spirit wants you to pray. The Spirit wants you to encounter Him in Scripture. The Spirit wants you to minister. I have done things because it was the right thing to do, that the Spirit wasn't on it, and it backfired. What, and I'm like, man, that didn't work. But no one never told me this stuff. So I'm just trying to witness to everybody. I can't witness. Those people aren't ready yet. Think about this. Jesus is on the cross, and there's two thieves. How come He ain't witnessing? What a place to witness. He's not talking to neither one of them. And he would not have, except one's cursing him. And the other one says to the one cursing him, what did this guy ever do? Now this guy starts encountering Jesus. Why? No man can come unto the Father unless the Spirit draws him. So the Spirit is on the one who says to Jesus, remember me. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So, you, you know, you've got to see, what is the Spirit doing? Well, Jesus knew what the Spirit was doing. This guy started tapping into Him. This guy's not tapping into Him. So, obviously, the Spirit's not on Him doing anything. So, I'm not required to try to get Him to get saved. But this guy over here, he's pulling on me. How about the rich young ruler? He turns away, around and walks away. Whereas Jesus just says to 12 guys, follow me, and they leave their family, they leave their businesses, and follow Him. Why? The Spirit is on the thing. When the Spirit is on it, whatever your hand touches prospers. If the Spirit's not leading you and guiding you, you're going to have defeat after defeat after defeat. And that's how, you know, if, you, if you're raising money. Let the Spirit be on your words. Let the Spirit be on what you're saying and doing. And you will, Paul says you'll have an abundance for every good work. But the minute you cut the Spirit off of your ministry and your life and your, 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 your whatever you're doing, what's He say in John 15? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, we don't have Him. So who's the part from me, Him? The Spirit. Right? So where we are as a church is I'm, do I'm done playing religious games and works. I'm, you know, try this, try that, do this, do that. And we got to just get to the place where we all have to individually. And then if we all individually ascend the mountain and hear Him for ourselves, we're all going to come off that mountain together in a church and it's going to be on fire. I'm telling you, glory is going to hit the place. But if everybody comes empty, and you can go to the seven virgins, not, not enough oil in their lamps. Where did you get the oil to, for the lamps? When you ascend the mountain. It's intimacy. It's being in His presence. It's shouldering the ark personally. So when Jesus says to the twelve disciples, come follow me, they're shouldering Jesus, who's the ark. So when He says, wait in the, in, and tarry for the Holy Spirit, they have to go to that upper room and they have got to sit there and wait because when, it, when the Holy Spirit comes, where, where did the Holy Spirit come? He came from above, and where did, he ascend, where did He descend? Come on, where did He descend? On them! And they shouldered it, and took that thing out into the streets. And the power of God hit that place. And when you get to Acts 17, it says they, they turned their known world upside down. Because it was the Holy Spirit on them. People they ran from, Boldness came on there and they stood up against them. So this is not to be done without the Holy Spirit. And so what we have to see is the Holy Spirit is Lord. Can I have one, can I say one more thing about this? It says, but when the moment one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. What veil? 
In this case, we don't have time to read it, but it's the Old Testament. Reading it through the lens of Moses rather than reading it through the lens of the Holy Spirit. So when they turn to Jesus, the veil is removed and they see Jesus in the Old Testament now. But it's not just the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is your only teacher. Now you can learn from other people, but you have to let the Holy Spirit filter what you're hearing. That's just not in church. That's anywhere at any place. Media, social media. Whatever you're hearing out there, if you're hearing it apart from the Holy Spirit, let me put it this way. If the Holy Spirit is not leading you into truth, everybody else is going to put a veil on you. If you're a Republican, they have a veil. If you're a Democrat, they have a veil. Everybody has a veil. The only one that doesn't have a veil is Jesus. I'm sorry to tell you that when you're listening to man, he's going to put a veil on you. And the only way to keep those veils off of you is what you're listening to, having the Holy Spirit as your filter to go, no, that's not true. No, we're not going to act like that. That's how that party acts. That's how they act. That's not the nature of the Lamb. That's not how we act. That's not how we do church. That's not how we do Jesus. And so the Holy and if you don't, you're going to get hook, line, and sinkered by politics and by religion. The very two things I tell you not to talk about. Politics and religion. Why? They veil the crap out of you. And you've got, to, you've got to turn to Jesus to get all those veils off. Otherwise, you're part of the problem. Politically or religiously. Or whatever, whatever camp, whatever it is you're listening to. You become part of the problem. The only way to stay free. What's it say here? Where the Spirit is Lord, there is what? The only way to stay free is to let the Holy Spirit keep unveiling Jesus to us. Who is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Amen. God bless you.